Okay. And, and um, you know, you've probably heard in life, you know, it's, it's like life's, you know, it's not about the, the, the destination, it's about the journey, right? You've probably heard that in life. Well, that's not the case in medical devices. It's the exact opposite. The medical device industry, really all you're concerned about, and again, lesson learned for me, is you're just really trying to reach uh, an exit. Um, so, and, and the, the quicker, the faster, the less expensive the journey is, the better. Um, and some of this might sound, it might sound trite, it might sound rhetorical, um, but it's actually, as I've learned, to be, to be quite critical. So be, before I start, I will, I will one caveat is that, um, you know, this is a very humbling industry. And anybody that sort of, you know, myself, any other experts that come up here, there's, there's nobody that has all the answers. And this was something, uh, this was a company, Avail Med Systems. Uh, I think they announced, yes, it was a couple weeks ago that they shut down. So Avail, uh, what it was is a technology, uh, essentially you installed in an OR and allows for remote support. And um, so whether it's, uh, you know, it was sort of conceived, the person who founded this was sort of conceived because they were traveling to New Zealand, oh, this was what I'd read. They were traveling to New Zealand and they had to observe a case and then they had to fly back and it was like, you know, one day travel there back and it was something that could have been done remote. And um, so this company raised 120 million, um, had a whole bunch of installs, had done extraordinarily well, and then just out of the blue a couple weeks ago, you know, wasn't able to close on some funding and shut down. And I think what's, what's pretty interesting about this story is that the people involved in it um, are not just, you know, they are, they are the, some of the godfathers in the medical device industry. So the CEO, Daniel Hawkins, um, was one of the first engineers at Intuitive, which is sort of pioneered robotic surgery. And uh, Daniel Hawkins also founded Shockwave Medical, uh, which uh, if you publicly traded, um, has over half a billion dollars of revenue, uh, market caps like probably close to 10 billion, been an extraordinarily successful company. So that was something he founded. I mean, this is, this is somebody as a CEO who has an extraordinary track record of success, far better. I mean, I could live or have 10 medical device careers you know, and I will never get to that level. Um, and then also on his board, he had Fred Mole, who was also the godfather of robotic surgery. Um, founded Intuitive, prior to that founded Hanson. So, you know, this is, this is a very, very difficult industry. And it was interesting. Um, I did have a chance to meet with uh, Daniel uh, for the first time, just an AdvoMed conference a bunch of weeks ago, prior to this news coming out. And, you know, one of the things, there were some folks from the Fogarty Institute there, uh, a guy named Andrew Cleland, and you know, it just that was one of the things. You, and these are again, this is that's a very successful group. Uh, they've had a lot of you know wins, but they remind folks. I mean, this is this is not easy. Uh, and in fact, if you look at um, my my background as a chartered accountant, I've been involved in a lot of different companies uh, over time uh, prior prior to joining the medical device industry. And I could say pretty confidently um, <laughs> that you know when you when you sign up to do anything in medical devices uh it's it's extraordinarily challenging and it's not for the faint of heart so and and it's not to say again you can have people that are extraordinarily experienced uh that, that don't ex uh, succeed so anyways just just pointing that out um so moving on you know, you talk about like startup finance and there, there are you know there are a lot of complexities to it but in a lot of ways it, it can boil down to some pretty simple things and and this ties into the concept of you know trying to get an exit is essentially like when you have a startup, you need money, so your investors give you money, and then all you're trying to do is return the money, right? Investors don't give you money because they, they like you or they wanna be your friend or anything like that. They, the reason they give you money is the expectation of getting it back and getting more money from than what you put in. I mean, if they, you put in a dollar, right? You want more than a dollar out, and the more you can give them and the faster you can do it, the higher the rate of return. And if you run the math, and this is the last time I was here, I you know, had a little chart here, but you know, if you look at you know, like what, 3X in three years, for example, I don't know, that, that works out to about a 40% annualized rate of return. So, you know, as opposed to 10X in 10 years, I think it's like a 20% annualized rate of return. So, I mean, you wanna do more, but you also wanna do it faster. And so that's really, you know, it's, it's Whenever you're starting a company and you have to take money, I mean, if you can't, if you don't have to take money, then that's great. But in you know, almost all medical device cases, you do uh, when you're starting a company. Is you know, you got to be thinking about okay, if if I am raising money from investors, reasonably, what can I expect to get give back to them? And that's not only true to medical device; it's like any startup, any company whatsoever. I mean, think about it. If somebody came and pitched you an idea, right? It's like, well, okay, that's great. You know, I can put some money, but how do I get my money back? And how do I get a return on that money? 
right? So this is like something fundamental. And you know, again, for as all for as complicated as startup finance can be, if, if you get this one concept, it's a good start. Um, so what are the ways that uh, you know, medical device companies can exit or investors can get their money back? And there's principally five different ways. Um, and the first one's uh, initial public offering or just going public. And so that is a, essentially, you know, all medical device companies, when they start, they're privately held companies, which means that the shares, you can't trade them, right? Once you own the shares, there's no market for them. But if you were to go public, uh, then you know you could go to an exchange like the Toronto Stock Exchange, Nasdaq, and sell your shares. Um, usually, going public in some limited circumstances is reserved for mature medical device companies that have at least ten to twenty million dollars of revenue. You know they have products. Uh, you know they have a, a path to growth. They have a path to gross margins. We'll talk a little bit about those things. Um, Interestingly, right now you could be you could have all those things, uh, but the IPO market is completely shut. Uh, nobody's going public right now. It's extraordinarily difficult, and the reason is is that a lot of investors are risk off because of the increase in interest rates and some other liquidity pressures. Basically, the, during COVID, in order to keep the world alive, federal banks had to inject a lot of capital. You know, like if you think about all the stimulus checks that were being given out and like the zero interest loans and all that kind of stuff that's all been sucked out. And so that sort of recoil has just completely shut the, the, public, the public markets. I think I saw some data uh, recently, and I, you know, I think like last year, usually in a year there might be 10 to 15 legit medical device IPOs, and maybe this year, like one. Um, so not a lot. The, the next one is a, is a secondary. Um, so a secondary is essentially when, um, so you have the shareholders and you have a, start, or a company, and somebody else in a private transaction just comes along and buys the, the shares from the existing shareholders. Um, so it's a fancy term, but it's relatively straightforward. It's just basically a, a share transaction between private groups. Um, yeah, it, one of the areas where you'll see a lot of secondary transactions is what's called private equity. Um, to give you an example, I, Medtronic had talked about, you know, they have some mature growth businesses, like some mature product lines that aren't really growing too much that don't really suit them well because there's a huge expectation that they grow. Um, so they've talked about spinning those off and just selling them and just selling them to a private party. So that's a secondary is, you know, okay, like somebody else just comes along and buys your shares, but that same person, if that's privately held, if there's no market for it, secondary is a little bit kicking the can down the road. Eventually that group's gonna wanna exit as well. I mean, the next thing is, is dividends, uh, which is essentially, you know, if a company's profitable, then you can, you can pay out a dividend to shareholders in the same way a company like Apple does or Amazon. Now again, in order to pay dividends, you, you do need to be profitable. Legally, you cannot pay dividends out if you are not profitable. Um, but th this, is, this is only applicable if, um, uh, you know, again, you know, the, the company is, you know, it, it has a track record of profitability and a dividend is a return on capital as opposed to a return of capital. So let's say you put 100 grand into a business and every year they were gonna pay you a $5,000 dividend, well, you're gonna to have to at least, I mean, sure, you're getting a 5% return, but you're going to have to wait at least 20 years before at least you've recouped your 100 grand, right? Just in terms of that return of capital. Um, the next one is a divestiture, and this is, a divestiture and an acquisition are, are, are kind of similar. Um, and so divestiture, like the classic example of this is Bayless Medical. Um, so some of you probably, you know, have heard of uh, Bayless, Chris Shaw, and, and Frank Bayless. Um, so they had they had several divestitures over the years. Uh, Doran Smiling, he actually previously worked for them. Um, the uh, so so Bayless was actually originally set up as a distributor, and then they decided to transition to um, uh, a model where they would develop and, and sell their own medical devices. And one of the ways they were able to fund the growth of their business uh, was so they would develop a product, they would get it to a certain level of maturity, and then they would just sell it. And they did this several times in sort of smaller transactions, and then they did a big one. And so their cardiology device business, they divested, I think it was two years ago, to Boston Scientific uh, for 1.75 billion US um, and two shareholders. Uh, so they ended up doing pretty well. Um, now they've been around a while, uh, but nice to see that we have some medical device billionaires in Canada. Um, now, the thing is, they didn't divest all of the business. Uh, they still have some products left. I think they, they have a energized guide wire and some steerable sheaths and some other things. Uh, but uh, that was how they were able to do it. Now, the reason 
Bayless never had any outside equity, outside capital. So they were kind of free to, to make their own decision. Um, the last one, and it's by far the most standard, is just an acquisition. And that is when you, know, you get the company to a point in stage where another medical device company says, comes in and says, I just want to buy this. You know, I want to add this company to my existing portfolio. And the fact of the matter is of these five options, um, really only one of them is commonplace. And that is, that is an acquisition. Um, in and, and by the way, there's stepping, so some of these you'll see companies go public, but then get acquired. We'll talk about one called OpSense, but it had been public for a while and then got acquired. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the vast majority of companies in medical device industry that, that are successful, that generate attractive returns to shareholders, it's because they get bought out. And I think with, with that being said, you know, we talk about, okay, you know, investors put money in, have to get money back. If the only viable path um, to getting, or the most common path to getting money out is through an acquisition, then you gotta be thinking from day one, what is something that somebody wants to buy? Um, it's interesting, one of the expressions is, that I've been using recently, uh, I don't know if I came up with it, I might've heard it somewhere, is, is that it's not a matter of whether somebody wants to buy your product, it's whether they wanna buy your company. Those are two very distinct things. And ultimately it's buying the company that generates the return for, for the shareholders. So any questions and keep on going. So, you know, one of the things that you might be saying is, oh, this is, this is great. Like, all right, I know what the end is, but I don't even know where to start. Like, I don't even know how to get going. And I had actually, you know, I gave a talk earlier this year. One of the things I talked about was, okay, you know, what, what's the template, how do you get going? And I think one of the most critical things for an early stage medtech company is, is early on having a very, very experienced team. And experience, um, experience and intelligence are not the same thing. Intelligence is, and I imagine all the people in this room are intelligent, right? Uh, I'm intelligent, I made 100 mistakes. Like I made every mistake possible. Um, there's 100 mistakes you can make in medical devices, I made 101. Um, the reason experience beats intelligence is because um, we live in a world where we have incomplete information and perfect information. You don't, you can be the smartest person in the room, but you don't know exactly, you know, what might trans transpire. But when you're experienced, you've seen it before. And that's not to say you should always reason by analogy, but when you have sort of that history, that that's a huge advantage. And um, and, and so, you know, the, the the definition of somebody who's an experienced or somebody who's an expert is really somebody who knows what mistakes you can't afford to make. That, that's it. Um, it. There's some mistakes you can't afford to make and you will make, uh, but there are definitely, you know, some that you cannot. And, you know, I'll give you an example, a medical device, um, you know, especially if you're talking about the end in mind, um, from day one, you need to be developing uh, a product that has, um, you know, that, that can be manufactured at scale with really, really, really good gross margins. That is, gross margins are absolutely critical. You know, the ability to sell it for one thing, but you manufacture it for considerably less. And it was interesting, I was talking to somebody recently who wants to start a company, and they, you know, they have two options. One option is this like amazingly kind of complex device that does, you know, this incredible stuff, but it's gonna be super expensive. And another thing is, is like, you know, something else that's really simple and dumb that won't be nearly as expensive. Um, it will provide less value to the customer, but on the balance of probabilities, it's something that uh, can probably be reliably uh, manufactured at scale for really, really good margins. And it's not, you know, like this is an example of the kind of mistake you can't make because like you can build a prototype and you can raise money, you can build a prototype for something that works. But if it doesn't work over and over and over and over again, and it can't be manufactured such that you, you're, you're generating a lot of margin, you're hooped. So anyways, that's where this, you know, cartoon comes from is these people in the room, you know, it's like when I looked at images, funny images, board of directors, it was kind of funny this came up is like, you know, board, surrounding yourself with really good advisors, really good board members, people that have been there, done that, because you could bring the idea to the table, you could be, um, experience, or sorry, you could be, you could be smart, but if you're not experienced, you know, if you haven't learned those mistakes and made, and, and, and uh, uh, made those mistakes and learned for those mistakes, um, 
you know, you're, you're going to be missing out. You definitely, this is not the kind of industry where you want to be, uh, it does happen, um, but for the most part, you don't want to be learning on the job. Um, so, so again, we, you know, we talk, we're talking about the end here, but the, the, the beginning, it's whether it's through the board or whether through advisors, is to try and get some people that have, you know, been through the, the ringer before and can steer you in the right direction. Um, so, so back to exits. Um, so one of the things, um, you know, I've come to learn is, so med- I mean, medical device is just, as I mentioned at the beginning, is just, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard, you know. You know, most people here that are, you know, if you're doing medventions, if you're a student, you're thinking of idea, you're like, boy, that's that's probably something that's really difficult to invent or to patent. And then I got to develop it. You know, I got to go through that process. Then I got to get it, you know, approved or cleared. And then I got to be able to manufacture, you know, I got supply chains. But all you add up all those things, um, they really actually don't amount to the most difficult challenge, which is selling. Selling is by far the most difficult part of the, the whole value chain. And, you know, it was really interesting. So I mentioned uh, there's a company called OpSense uh, out of Montreal. It's been around a while. And uh, they had a technology, it was, it's called FFR, Fractional Flow Reserve. And what it does is it basically measures kind of the, the pressure in the, the coronaries. So it, it kind of gives you a sense of how blocked a vessel is. And, um, you know, company had done, the company had done, you know, pretty well as, you know, I think it had, uh, you know, trailing last 12 months revenue, 30, 35 million, solid growth, 10 to 15% per year, solid, um, uh, solid margins, 50%. Uh, they, uh, they had also introduced a product for uh, aortic valve. So in the same way you can measure sort of how blocked a, a coronary artery is, you can measure how blocked a, um, a aortic valve is. But, um, but there's this there's this very sort of poignant quote that appeared. This is from the Global Mail that says that if you are a company and you only have two products to sell, it is extraordinarily difficult to generate to have a profitable sales force, especially in direct markets. Um, Bayless was actually one of the exceptions. Uh, they were able to do it, uh, but it is just I mean, so there's an exception to every rule. But all things being equal, uh, sales um, are extraordinarily difficult. And this is particularly sort of the, the US market. I mean, getting into, which is the vast majority of, of companies, that's where you're focused. So, um, so yeah, selling. So, so what is it that you know, makes selling so difficult to, to hospitals? And again, I'll focus on the US. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, you talk about the major medical device companies, the, the market that they value more than any other is the United States. And it's because it's the largest, um, you know, they have the most specialists, um, they uh, sort of, they do the most complex procedures, they have the most demand uh, for, for sort of new and novel medical devices. Um, and then, you know, sort of the, the sense globally, and this has changed a little bit over time. It used to be that Europe was a little bit more of a focus to begin with. But since they introduced some changes to um, you know the way you get CE mark, that's no longer the case. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, so the, the, the idea is, is like if you get approval and, 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 and you're successful in the U.S., you can be successful anywhere. So why is it so hard? Well, first off, we live in a cost-centric healthcare system where it's all about cost, cost, cost. Um, you know, whether it's Canada, the United States, anywhere. I mean, it's it's just very difficult to to, to be value-based to measure outcomes. And so the easy thing is to measure cost. And the fact of the matter is, it's like, well, I mean, if we can save money, we will. Um, hospitals have insanely long sales cycles, insanely long. Um, you know, if you're looking to sell, let's say you have a piece of capital equipment, unless you are giving that capital, a capital equipment is, again, something that's not reusable. Um, so like Kanavi, we have a console and that connects to a single use disposable. If you have a, a, a piece of capital equipment, um, you know, that's a year plus to get it through because the hospital doesn't get paid for that capital. They have to find money through, you know, a surplus in their budget, through foundation, through something else. They're not, you know, and those, those are long planning cycles. Disposables are a little bit easier. Um, you know, they, there's, but it still can be easily three to six months. Um, you have, you know, hospitals have massive leverage in the United States. They have been consolidating like crazy. Hospital systems by hospital systems. They go through these things called group purchasing organizations um, where they can just squeeze the life out of you. Um, they, there's value analysis committees, which are basically a hospital's way of saying, you know, back to the cost centric system, we are just going to scrutinize the heck out of, you know, what it is we're buying. 
Uh, and in a lot of cases, it becomes a chicken and egg proposition because they want data. They want a lot of data to s support the fact that they're buying something uh, that's new. But if you're new, it's really hard to get that data. Um, education and training, um, you know, especially depending on the complexity of the procedure and the complexity of the device, you know, physicians are they're doing a lot of things. Um, you know, if you need to teach them how to use the device, um, if you need to, to support them, case support, you know, I mentioned Avail, that was part of Avail's thinking was like, how can we make the sales process a little bit easier by not having people physically in the room? Uh, product iteration. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is like, you know, medical devices aren't like drugs where after you've developed it, that's it, the molecule or the, the protein or whatnot. That's it. I mean, medical devices go through constant cycles of iteration based on, you know, customer feedback. You need people in the room supporting, um, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to gather that feedback, to figure out, you know, to be ahead of your competition, all these things. And then lastly, I mean, it's, it's end of life. I mean, you, you don't have, um, you know, there's only a matter of time before something becomes commoditized. And it depends on the complexity, uh, but you, you look at stents, for example, uh, you know, it used to be, um, you know, 15 years ago, if you, if a stent fell on the floor while you were doing your interventional cardiology fellowship, I think you would get fired. And nowadays it's like, you just kick it to the side. Like nobody cares because the pricing went from several thousand dollars to several hundred. And there's, I mean, there's, you know, there's still iterations happening in stents, but it doesn't come in nearly the pricing that it used to. So what does this all mean? Um, so what it means is because you have all these pressures and all these difficulties to sell, you get this, you know, fancy economic phenomenon called economies of scope, which means that if you had two companies each trying to sell one product, they would be far less efficient than one company selling two products. And then if you had a hundred companies each individually selling uh, one product and you had one company selling hundred products, that company selling hundred products would do extraordinarily better. Uh, they're able to bundle, they're able, they have leverage themselves. They are able to, you know, a salesperson rather than them going into the room and only having one product to sell. They have, again, a hundred. So that's why you see sort of a massive consolidation in the medical device industry. It's because the big companies that have been successful, you know, they have sort of the, the sales infrastructure. It was interesting. You know, I was, I was listening. This is uh, an event uh, probably about a month ago. Chris Shaw was talking about um, the, you know, one of the reasons why Boston bought uh, Bayless. And one of the attractive things was to, to, to Boston um, was that Bayless had, I think, I don't know, it was 120 plus salespeople in the United States that really knew the cardiac electrophysiology space. And Boston had really, their position had slipped there. And, you know, they, and so, you know, Boston wanted also access to like this trained sales force that they could plug in there, that they could start giving other products to and let them get going. So that, you know, that the, the, the sort of the, the dynamics and the, the economics of the way a sales force works um, is, uh, it's, it's very, I think it's very unique to this industry. Um, so again, I talked about sort of industry consolidation. If you just look at the top 10 companies, um, you know, they account for, you know, the, the global medical device industry is about half a trillion dollars annually. Um, it's probably about 40%. Um, so it gets to sort of like, it, it, it's like a Pareto principle when, you know, if you were to expand this to, you know, the, the top 20% of companies, you would easily get the top 80% of revenues. Um, and you look at them, I mean, Abbott bought St. Jude Medical. I mean, St. Jude Medical was massive. Uh, Medtronic bought uh, Covidian years ago. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, uh, they just bought Abiomed, $14 billion company. Uh, other ones, uh, Beckton Dickinson, they bought uh, C.R. Bard. Uh, G, actually, Ginger's G Healthcare just spun out. Um, you know, so you, you see, like, the, uh, it is an industry where, like, the bigger you are, um, the, the more sort of power you have. And, it, and, and in, in many ways, a lot of these companies, they, they kind of stay in their lanes. Um, example, like, Stryker doesn't do anything in cardiology. Uh, J&J doesn't do anything in coronary. They do a lot of stuff in EP. Um, you know, Fresenius is entirely like diabetes or, or maybe it's, um, uh, what should we call it? Dialysis. Like it's, it's interesting also how they're, they're, they're massive, but they're also massive in very, very specific verticals. I mean, there's definitely competition between them, but they've kind of built their own, their own monoliths. Um, and they've just become huge. And, and quite frankly, I don't care 
how you're good to, how good your technology is. If you are going up against the Abbott, Medtronic, J and J, et cetera, et cetera, Salesforce, you're not going to win. You're just I don't care what you could you could cure heart disease. It's not going to happen. It's just it's too powerful. So um, so let's let's just sort of dig sort of further into these economics. Um, so let's say you were to look, so P&L stands for profit and loss, by the way. It's just like, your, it's your income statement, right? So income statement, you take like your revenue, uh, you minus your cost, COG stands for cost of goods sold. Then you were to subtract your, your sales expenses, your R&D, your admin, and then you get your income. So typically like if you're a commercial stage medical device company, um, so your revenue, you know, let's say, you, you know, you just ignore the percentages for, for a sec. Let's say, um, you know, like you get $100 of revenue and uh, if you're doing really, really well, this is great. Like if you can get, if you can get 80% margin. So you're, you're, a product that costs you, uh, that you sell for hundred dollars, you can you make, you cost you $20 to make. That's amazing. That's, that's exceptional. And that's like, that's a, that's a variable cost is, is that the, um, not on a percentage basis, but on a dollar basis, every more unit you sell, you have to, you have to incur more cost. The sales is also variable because if you want to sell more, uh, you have to incur more costs. And the sales, you really, if, you're, if you want to grow, you have to invest very, very heavily in that. Um, to the extent a lot of growth stage medical device companies, um, it's, it's almost equal to their revenue. And again, that's just not just sales forces. That's, I mean, that could you know, include other clinical activities, whether it's training. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very exhaustive effort to educate the market on a new technology. R&D, um, which is usually, and, and then also your admin costs, it's usually about 20% each, they're fixed. So your R&D doesn't necessarily go up because your revenue went up or down, same with your admin costs. So what you end up is, you know, if you had $100 in revenue, you, you end up losing $40 uh, in income, which isn't bad, like is, is the, um, uh, if, if you see this income, and you'll see a lot, I mean like a, a Nari Medical Shockwave, some of the companies that have done really well that are publicly traded, um, you'll see that. I mean, you'll see, um, uh, you know, as long as they can grow that top line. You've seen some other companies like Acutus Medical, uh, they spent a lot on sales and some other activities, um, but they weren't able to grow their revenue. And then the, the company, you know, just, just cratered, like they, they laid off a bunch of people. Um, so, so that's what a startup looks like. A startup's losing money, um, which is fine though, because it's, as we'll discuss, it would actually, on its own, it's not sustainable. But in the context of becoming part of a larger company, um, it would be very attractive. So you look at a large company, um, you know, their COGS, uh, they tend to be about closer to 40%. Now, the reason that's the case, it's not because they can actually manufacture for less, uh, but usually their product mix, they have more of some mature products in there that they can typically charge for less um, just because they're closer to being commoditized. Now, here's the, here's the kicker is a lot of their sales costs are fixed. They have the sales infrastructure, they have the people, you know, they have the back end, they, they know how to do all the clinical training, et cetera. So they can add products, they can bolt on companies and that sales will not, that, that those sales costs will not go up. Um, R&D and admin typically are lower um, because these are just larger companies, uh, the larger your company on a percentage basis, probably the less you'll spend on these. And so the income, they end up earning about 20%, which is you know really good if you were to look at a, a Medtronic or a Boston, um, that's generally the, the, the range that they're in. But what's critical, if you look at sort of the, the big delta between the startup and the, the large company, is the fact that the sales, they don't, they don't incur that cost. Um, they already have the, the massive established sales force. They have the power within the hospital, they can bundle, they can do all that stuff that as a startup you would ordinarily have to uh, have to take care of. So, so if you're at a large company and, you know, in a large company, the expectation is you have to continue growing every year, every year, every year, you got to keep, you know, like there's no, no stasis. So you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, I got a product here that is 80% uh, or 80% margins. If I, if I bought this product, I wouldn't have to incur the sales costs. I already have a sales force. I can fire all the salespeople that happens. Abbott just bought a company called Cardiovascular Systems that for about a billion dollars, and you know it's a, a product for decalcifying uh, in the coronaries, and they basically just fired everybody day one. They didn't need the salespeople, so it's like okay, and it's it's not uncommon. Um, so it's like okay, sales, we don't need those salespeople, so I can get rid of that eighty percent. R and D, I'm still going to have to incur because you want to iterate that product, right? 
Um, an admin, I can get rid of all the admin people. You don't need the finance folks. We can go because um, I already have them. So it actually becomes super attractive. So if you look at standalone, it's kind of like, eh. But if you look at in the context of a large company, very, very attractive. And if you have a, a startup with high margin recurring revenue, that means, again, that you're, you're in like the 80, you got to be at least north of like 70%. Um, uh, well, maybe not, not quite 70, but you got to, you know, you, you definitely got to be north of 50. Um, really high margins. Um, recurring revenue means, um, you know, it's not a, it's not a one-time sale. So that's another issue when you have a, a capital product is you sell it once and then you say bye to the customer and you see them again in five years. You want something that you can sell over and over and over and over. Um, you know, it's like your, I don't know, your Spotify subscription or something like that. Like every month you're going to get charged. It'll just keep on rolling. Um, and if it fits into what's called an existing call point. So a call point is just a fancy term for saying that's where we have people in the hospital already selling. You have a really attractive acquisition candidate. Really, really attractive. Um, so the question becomes now, how much will an acquirer pay? And, you know, this, so we'll, we'll do some math here and it might look a little bit complicated, but it's, it's really not. I mean, medical device companies, um, you know, you think about, um, I don't know, some of the other tech companies that are out there, um, I don't know, Snap or something like that, or NFT, think about NFTs for example. I mean, you know, what caused NFTs to go up? Well, I mean, it was basically just like voodoo, right? It was just like, oh, somebody else will pay more for it. So that's not how medical device companies are valued. Medical device companies, the big ones, the big ones, are valued based on their cash flow. All they care about is cash flow. All they care about is, you know, what are they generating in earnings and how much cash can they spit out? Um, so what they're looking at is when they buy a company, how much cash can that company contribute once I buy it? So if you looked at the company, let's say a company today has $100 in, um, $100 in, uh, in revenue and their contribution margin, when I say that, so if you subtract COGS and you subtract the other costs they have to continue incurring like an R&D, let's say you get to $20 left over, right? Um, so that's actually not a, a, a you know, 20% contribution margin isn't great, but that's okay. Um, and uh, you can also assume some price erosion in there, but that's not a big deal. So let's say you, know, you were to do that year over year and you were to use a, a cost of capital rate of 10%, um, which is you know, ordinarily the case, but the cost of capital has actually gone up because of the interest rates, right? If you can put your money in a GIC for 5.5%, why would you like, invest in a company that you know, only gives you a 10% return? So anyways, if you, do, um, if you do these calculations over 10 years, the net present value of this company is about uh, $584, which doesn't make sense actually. Am I actually done on the wrong line? Uh, no, 240. Yeah, no, it should actually be less. We're gonna add up all these numbers. I think it's less. 90. Anyways, Dorian, can you add this in your head? <laughs> Anyways, you get a number here. I think it's actually less than 584. I think I, I just added the wrong line or something. Um, but you would get a net present value. And that's what they're looking at. They're saying like, how much cash will this business contribute to my business? And that's how they're valuing you. That's it. That's as simple. And it's and then what they do is then they come up with a revenue multiple. So let's say this business was, um, let's say this business was um, actually worth five eighty four and it was a hundred uh, of current revenue. They would come up with a revenue multiple of five point eight four. And so you'll 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 regularly hear revenue multiples that are quoted. Um, but uh, you, know, you might think, oh, well, the company is being valued just based on its revenue. No, it's being valued based on its cash and revenue is just the sort of the, the proxy. That's the, how, we, how we arrive at it. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you start to look at different scenarios for if you look at like annual revenue growth and contribution margin, you can get a sense of, um, you know, basically how much a um, uh, how much an acquirer might pay for your business. So if you are growing at, uh, you know, let's say you're growing at 20% per year, which is pretty good, and you have a 40% contribution margin, uh, then you're going to be, yeah, you're, I mean, a 10x plus is is pretty good. Um, you know, that's this is this is this is essentially sort of the how you arrive at. It. And if you just sanity check it, like I remember I did, OpSense. So OpSense was. I think close to an 8x revenue multiple 
and I think they were in this range because I think they had about 15% year over year growth and their contribution margin between, if you backed out, um, uh, if you backed out, their gross margins uh, were about 50%, and I think they had about 10% in R&D. Um, so that's how they got to, it was, it was around an eight, because um, they were bought for about, yeah, 320 million or so, and I think they had like 40 million of lost 12 months revenue. So, you know, sometimes you look at these revenue multiples, and uh, and depending on how, the, you know, what the market looks like, again, if if the market, you know, like during during COVID, when the you know the cost of capital sank, um, people would pay more for companies because um, you could justify that from a net present value standpoint. Now that the cost of capital has gone up, you pay less. So there's some other factors involved, like the cost of capital, um, but usually for medical device companies, it's around that that ten percent. So so having sort of like you know revenue growth, having contribution margin, um, that'll give you higher cash flows. And that'll give you a higher revenue multiple. And the other thing that, that really helps the dynamic um, is having a large pool of potential acquirers. And one of the slides I have, you know, when Ken Abbey pitches investors, I basically have like, here are all the companies that are working on intravascular imaging on the, on the left. And on the right are, here are all the major medical device companies that have cardiovascular franchises. And so what I do is from the companies on the left that are working from intrava on intravascular imaging, I basically just take out the ones that somebody could buy. And there's really actually today, there's only two. There's, there's Canavi, there's a company called SpectraWave. And I said, if one of the companies on the right wants to buy one of the companies on the left, you only have, you can only make, there's only one or two companies to buy. And that's a pretty good dynamic. So, um, you know, it's, it's, there's some other factors. That I, again, when it comes time to buying one, they'll still come down to cash flows and things like that. They'll still make that decision. But having, um, you know, a large pool of acquirers helps. And that's when I, I, I go back and it's, I say it's, it's less about, certainly you need to demonstrate that you can sell the product, um, but it's more about, uh, or somebody will buy the product, but it's more about um, that somebody will buy the company. And it was interesting, one of the lessons I learned, it was at a seminar earlier this year and there was a company that got acquired and they said, don't worry about top line. Uh, don't, don't worry about the actual revenue. Worry about revenue metrics. So, give you an example. Like, let's say, let's say you have a technology and you go into ten hospitals in the United States, and in that ho those hospitals, ten hospitals, you dominate those accounts, right? Like the physicians, it's really sticky. You're using it over and over, blah blah blah. Like you're just doing a great job. You're doing. You have a tiger team. You have a small sales team, and they're just doing a really good job. And you can kind of show, like, you know, this isn't an aberration. Like this is a representative sample. Versus, you know, let's say that only generates five hundred thousand dollars of revenue or some small amount. Uh, versus having, you know, going to a lot of hospitals generating a lot of revenue, uh, but uh, then also having to spend a, a fortune on sales and marketing. Well, the 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 first strategy where you actually focus on revenue metrics um, is actually much more attractive to an acquirer and and sort of better for your own business because what they're looking at doing they're looking at extrapolating. They're saying, okay, you're in ten hospitals. You're doing a great job. I'm in 2,000 hospitals. What could I do with 2,000 hospitals, right? So then I start mapping out what the revenue growth might look like, and I start thinking about, okay, well, how can this be manufactured? Can we actually get margin out that, stuff like that? And the revenue metrics can actually be more powerful than the revenue itself, if done properly. And it can also be much less costly where you don't need a massive sales team. Because as I showed, you know, you're, you're going to have to spend a lot to, to really get the ball rolling on sales and marketing. Um, so there's a couple other considerations uh, whenever you sell a company. Um, there's, uh, so there, you know, it's what do you get, you know, it, it back. And um, so, for example, when, you know, Bayless was sold, uh, they got cash. But that's not always the case. <clears throat> So there was a company, you know, a really great company in Toronto called 7D Surgical that got bought uh, years ago. Um, did really well, it was bought by C-Spine, I think it was 100 billion. It was fun out of Sunnybrook, by the way. Um, and I think there was like 20 million of cash and 80 million of stock in the acquirer. So they are gonna say, okay, we're gonna give you 20 million of cash, but you know, it's like 80 million, the rest is just you get shares of our company. And usually those shares are restricted, so you can't you know, sell them for a while, you gotta hold on to them. Um, there's ways you can unlock value, you can borrow against them, blah, 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 although it's not always the best idea. 
But it, so the first thing is you might not always get cash. You might, you might actually end up getting stock. The second one that's a really big consideration, this happens a lot, um, is upfront versus earnout. So the acquirer might say, okay, you know, this is this could be a really valuable business, but I don't know. I want to like I want to kind of de-risk things a little bit. Um, and so what they'll say is like, okay, I'll, I'll pay you something up front, uh, but uh, if you hit certain milestones downstream, I'll pay you more. And um, obviously, if you are selling your business, you want as much upfront as you can get. You don't want to wait, right? Um, if you're a company though, you can really, again, de-risk things and have an insurance policy uh, by having an earner to say, okay, yeah, we will we will pay, but it's gotta be contingent on how well the product does in the future. Um, you know, a good example, there was a company called Limflow that was just acquired by Inari. And I think like the upfront, I forget the amount, whether the upfront is 140 or 250, but anyways, it was, I think it was about half and half. Like it wasn't, you know, there was this, there was a, there was a meaningful upfront but there was also a huge portion of it that was earnout, where you're going to have to sort of sit there and wait. And the issue with earnouts is um, they can become incredibly difficult to negotiate um, because, you know, give me an example. It's like, you know, you talk about, okay, well, we're going to do it based on sales metrics. And well, it's like, okay, but you're going to do it based on sales metrics. Well, how do I know that you guys are actually going to devote or you, you know, the new company is actually going to devote resources to my product. How do I know you're, how do I know that this isn't like a defensive acquisition where actually we don't have to go into that too much, but it's like, oh, I only bought this product because I don't want company X to get it. You like earnouts can take a very, very long time to negotiate. They can be very contentious after the fact. I was involved in an exit where like, you know, I, I think the deal was supposed to get done in, you know, two, three months. And because of the earnout, I think it took three times that, like it was just insane. It just kept on going on and on. It was things around like, you know, like you had to get cogs down to a certain level in a certain time frame. But you know, it's, it's, you know, when you start really thinking about it, you dig it into it, it's like, well, you know, I, do I have the assurance that it's gonna be properly worked on? Or what about this contingency? Or how do we factor in, you know, something crazy that might happen, like exchange rates or all sorts of things. So earnouts, they're, they're standard, they happen. Uh, but they can be extraordinarily challenging to negotiate and enforce. Um, and I think the, um, this one of the one investment maker told me, I think the rule of thumb on our notes is um, you assign, uh, like if it, the earnout's 100 million, just assume that's equivalent to getting 20 million today. It's like a point two. Um, and that's, that's based on a couple of things. That's based on like the time value of money and just the, the likelihood of getting it. But that was like his rule of thumb in terms of um, earnout probability. And then the last thing is, so when we actually look here, so the revenue multiple isn't the revenue multiple of equity, it's the revenue multiple of the entire company. Um, so it's how much the entire company is worth. And one thing to note is, is that companies can be financed using equity and debt. And so in order to actually get the proper equity value, you need to basically take the price, you back out the debt and you add the cash. So I'll explain to you what I mean here. Let's say. Let's say we weren't talking about a medical device company. Let's say we we're talking about a house. Let's say housing prices were actually rational for a change. And the value of a house was the present value of how much you could rent it out for, okay? So let's say a house is the, 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 the present value, the net present value is a million dollars, but there's a mortgage left on it of a half a million. How much do you pay for that house? There's a million dollars and there's a half million dollar mortgage. How much do you pay for the house? Like how much equity would you want to put into it? Half a million, Half a million. that's right. Congratulations, all right? Um, but let's say that, um, you know, let's just say there happened to be a, um, a, a $50,000 trunk of cash sitting in that, that house. Um, so you get, you get a house plus you get $50,000 uh, trunk of cash that just happens to be sitting there. How much are you gonna pay for that? that how much are you gonna pay now? Plus fifty thousand, right? And the reason being is, is like you know, if I, you know, half of, if I have a house here, plus I'm going to give you fifty thousand dollars. It's the same thing with the company. If I have, you know, a company worth, um, let's just assume, there's no debt, uh, but uh, it's worth a hundred million dollars, but I have ten million of cash there. 
you're gonna have to pay 110 million. You're gonna have to pay, like that cash can actually be used to buy the company. So no, I'm not just giving you that cash for free. So one thing to note is you have to do a slight adjustment. It's a minor thing, but just to be aware of is you're not actually valuing the equity. The equity is what ended up going to your shareholders, by the way, right? That's who the people we were trying to solve for at the beginning. Um, so that's just one thing to be aware of. And then the last thing is like M&A, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's, um, uh, but, but the good thing is, is that when I say it's difficult, it's difficult on the lawyers and the accountants. Because <laughs> um, these are very complex transactions. There's a lot of considerations, tax and, and whatnot. Fortunately, you know, usually you, um, as the, you know, if you're, if you're running a company, you, you won't be involved quite in that. You gotta shepherd that process through. Sometimes there can be, you know, other, other times there can be, and usually this is only when big companies buy big companies, um, there's, there's, there's sort of um, regulatory considerations about uh, you know, antitrust laws and stuff like that, although it doesn't happen too much in med tech. Um, you know, usually you're not too involved, but just so you're aware, if you sell a company, there's a ton of stuff that ends up happening uh, behind the scenes in terms of the legal agreements and all the accounting and the tax and, and blah, blah, blah. And you don't have to deal with it. Again, that's why, um, you know, you, you have professional advisors, but it's, it's, it's something that's, it's pretty big. Um, so that was it on exits. I was going to just sort of talk briefly about Canada for a moment, unless anybody has any uh, questions. Uh, I guess, I guess not. Okay. So I think, you know, it's, you know, one of the things that I was, I was thinking about when I did this presentation, um, and I was thinking about, you know, some of the seminars I've been to recently in the States. Um, you know, one of the things they'll tell you in the States is that companies aren't sold, they're bought. And, um, which means that you don't, you, the, the goal is you run a really solid company you solve for all these things, but you're not really trying to set yourself up necessarily to get bought. And then one day somebody comes along and buys you. It's like a house, right? Like it's, it's like people that flip houses versus, you know, okay, like you actually lived in it for many years, you took care of it. And one day somebody comes along and gives you a really attractive offer. And I think that is true in the United States and perhaps elsewhere where they have really, really robust ecosystems. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think it's the case in Canada. Um, I think in Canada, um, quite frankly, we have to play by a different set of rules um, just based on the stage where the ecosystem's at. Um, you know, I've been in medical devices now in Canada for 12, 13 years, and um, it's actually the fact that you know, I'm one of the senior authorities is a little bit troubling. <laughs> it's not, because you, know, you go to folks in the, um, you, know, you go to conferences in the US, and it's not me who's speaking. You know, it's people that have built and sold many companies. Um, so the question becomes, so you, we're in Canada and we don't have access to capital and we don't have all the talent that they do in the U.S. in terms of people that have like been there, done that, just been through the ringer immediately. Um, like, like it's just, it's really readily available there. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, I don't know for, for those of you who have seen the movie Moneyball, uh, it's about the, the, the Oakland A's, um, which is a baseball team, but unfortunately will be a baseball team because they're moving to Las Vegas. Um, and the Oakland A's, you know, were a team that uh, for many years have had success, uh, but they're not a very wealthy team. Uh, and uh, they had to like rethink the game because they didn't have the money, you know, they couldn't buy the superstars that everybody else could. And there's sort of this great quote from the movie. It's like where Brad Pitt goes, there are rich teams and there's poor teams. Then there's 50 feet of crap. Then there's us. And it's to say that they're not playing by the same rules. Um, in the same way, the United States, it's a very rich, robust ecosystem. They have a lot of money and a lot of people that know what they're doing. We're not quite there. So they, so in Moneyball, the whole thing is, is like, you can't buy superstars. You can't buy the people that'll hit home runs and, you know, you know the, the brand names. But, but what you can do is you can get people that can get on base. And it doesn't matter in baseball, you can get on base, you can get hit by a pitch, you can walk, you can hit, you know, you can just hit a ball, you can bunt a ball or whatever. Like, th so the question they ask themselves, like when they're evaluating talent is no longer, you know, is this player a superstar, but can they get on base? And the, the analogy here to Canada is that in Canada, I think where we're at is a medical device ecosystem. We're not yet at the point where we can build a company that will be like an anchor medical device company. I think we are several generations away from anything. I think the last company that really kind of grew to become an anchor medical device company was Intuitive. 
Um, I think we are several, if any, generations away from that happening. Um, we, I think we are several, if any, generations away from having a truly sustainable long-term medical device company. Bayless couldn't do it. I mean, Bayless recognized that they had, with their cardiology business, which is doing extraordinarily well, they either had to sell it or they had to start becoming a big acquirer or maybe go public. They just, you know, they made the decision to sell. I, I don't think in Canada, realistically, the 12 years I've spent in this industry, we're at that point. But I think what we can do is we can develop companies that for lack of a better term are singles and doubles, where we still do very well, where we still generate excellent returns to investors and we sort of develop technologies and we just get them to a point where we're not looking to necessarily globalize, we're not necessarily looking to, um, you know, be big sort of, again, like, you know, have big stamp cannon on our backs and stand the last test of time, is is just get something that's, um, uh, that's uh, that you know we can get to a point where we can we can exit, and uh, you know I've been involved with a couple of companies now. One being um, you know Xpan, and Xpan's thing from day one was always we're going to try and get this company to a point immediately where it's attractive to an acquirer. Because and, and when it is when it does get bought, it's it's like you know everybody can still do like the investors, the employees, everybody can do extraordinarily well, extraordinarily well. Uh, Canabi, we we've changed our philosophy. We are much more now looking explicitly towards an exit. We used to have sort of this mentality that, okay, we'll try to build something for the long term. Unfortunately, it's just not realistic. Um, and so we are now positioned, like where do we have to get the company to where we would be really attractive to an acquirer? So I, I think this is something where, um, you know, um, again, if you talk about experts or people that know which mistakes not to make, um, this would be one if you were trying to build a, a medical device company in Canada. You can't, quite frankly, you can't afford to be swinging for a home run. You have to just think about how can I get a really solid company? You know, yeah, it's really, I mean, there's maybe, I know there's Puzzle Medical, which is in Montreal, which is going for a PMA, like, like big trials, big money, all that kind of stuff. There's certainly the exception to the rule, but you know, if you can, if you can have a company that generates or that, that raises 10 million, you know, 15 million, and you can get an exit for 100 million, which is, Consider it sound like a single, that's, that's amazing. You've done your job. And you'll recycle capital in the ecosystem and everyone will be super happy. As opposed to having to raise hundreds of millions of dollars and then getting an exit for like a billion dollars or something like that, which is just, they can do it in the US. I don't think they can, I don't think they can do it here. So um, that's an editorial. So this is my opinion and all of it is just, you know, my own sort of thinking. So again, and, as I started the conversation or the, the talk is, um, you know, nobody's truly, I mean, if the guys at Avail couldn't get it done, I mean, who am I to, to necessarily judge? So anyways, that is, uh, that is it. Um, so really appreciate everybody listening. I hope you found it useful. I see some questions, happy to, happy to take questions. I mean, there's my contact information if you want to reach out. And honestly, I still call it Twitter. Um, and I still will call it Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, thank you so much.